Hong Kong is known as the Oriental Pearl. Tourism figures from the Golden Week in early October, an eight-day holiday in mainland China, have made many Hong Kong people realize that their city has lost its previous prosperity. How did it happen? Let's start with the recent bombshell comment made by a Hong Kong actor. On October 5, 2023, the renowned Hong Kong film star Zhou Renfa was awarded the Asian Filmmaker of the Year Award at the 28th International Film Festival in Busan, South Korea. In an interview with reporters, he confessed that after the handover of Hong Kong's sovereignty in 1997, the government's restrictive measures had put the Hong Kong film industry in a difficult situation and he spoke highly of the freedom of creativity of South Korean films. We have a lot of restriction now. It's very difficult for the filmmakers. But honestly, we will try our best to do our Hong Kong Spirits movie. This is our goal. But somehow, up to 1997, uh, a lot of different things change, you know, so we have to uh, pay attention to our government, the direction, you know, this is important. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll be, we will got very hard to get all the money to build up a story and then shoot a movie. Because the mainland China market is so huge, so we you trying some s solution for for the way to make living. I came into this world with nothing, and when I go, I can't take anything with me. These things aren't mine, and those who need them can take them. The reason why South Korean dramas are so popular is that they have a wide range of themes, probably because of the support of the government, and have a lot of freedom. Their creative talents are very broad-minded. I am impressed by many of the themes. They are so bold to make these films. I think their imagination and creativity are amazing. It's nice to see, it's nice to see. I'm so very happy, very excited. Zhou Renfa's comments resonated with the Chinese public and sparked a round of heated discussion, but those discussions were blocked by China's online censorship. Zhou has in the past openly supported social movements in Hong Kong, such as the Umbrella Movement and the Anti-Extradition Movement movement. As a result, he has reportedly been blacklisted by the Chinese government. This has made some people worry that he might be targeted by the Chinese government because of his remarks. He has also been warned to be extra careful when he returns to Hong Kong. Hong Kong has introduced a series of laws and regulations on film content in recent years. The Hong Kong government issued a guideline in 2021 that requires national security considerations to be taken into account when screening films. According to the Film Censorship Amendment Bill passed in the same year, films that are detrimental to national security will be banned. Originally, Hong Kong had freedom of speech and freedom of creative production. Satirizing the government and the police wouldn't be said to be suspected of violating the national security law. It was free under British governance. However, with the implementation of One Country, Two Systems in Hong Kong in 1997, and after the Hong Kong government proposed to amend the extradition bill in 2019, the judicial independence of Hong Kong has been seriously compromised. Recently, on September 25th, the head of Hong Kong's leading journalist group was sentenced to five days in jail for obstructing police officers in September last year. It's a case seen by critics as a further blow to media freedoms in the financial hub. Ron Sun Chan, chairman of the Hong Kong Journalists Association, was detained and handcuffed by two plainclothes officers while covering a story after he failed to hand over his personal identity card. Chan, who pleaded not guilty, earlier told the court that he had asked the police to show them their warrant cards before handing over his document, which all Hong Kong residents must carry. I would say the rule of law can be conducted in open court. 
Everyone can see regarding the judge and magistrate in the case that everyone has their own judgment about what this is. The magistrate granted Chan $3,838.48 bail after his lawyers said he would appeal. The journalist cannot leave Hong Kong and had to surrender his travel documents. Chan once worked for the liberal media Stan News. In December 2022, the media was raided by the police, its assets were frozen, and several staff members were arrested. It was forced to close shortly thereafter. Free speech is the mother of all freedoms. Without free speech, other freedoms won't exist. Freedom is also a prerequisite for the development of finance and trade. That's why given the loss of freedom in Hong Kong, it's safe to say its economy is unlikely to rebound. Hong Kong used to have an open and market-driven economic tradition. However, with the increasing integration with mainland China in trade, tourism and finance, and the loss of various freedoms, Hong Kong's top position as a free economy has fallen. Hong Kong's politics, economy, and culture are all on the way to decline. October 1st was the celebration of the anniversary of the CCP regime in China. The Hong Kong government was obligated to hold a grand celebration following its handover to China. Starting September 29th, mainland China took an eight-day holiday known as the Super Golden Week. It was estimated that more than one million mainland tourists visited Hong Kong. Hong Kong originally expected that with this long holiday, mainland tourists would boost the economy of Hong Kong. Earlier on, the Hong Kong government claimed on several occasions that the economy of Hong Kong was recovering well. Over the past year, Hong Kong has emerged from the pandemic and our economy is gradually improving. In the first half of this year, private consumption expenditure rose by 10.5% year-on-year, while exports of services grew markedly by about 20%. In the first eight months this year, the value of total retail sales increased by nearly 20%. In the first nine months, visitor arrivals surpassed 23 million, and the latest unemployment rate has decreased to 2.8%. In fact, the figures provided by the Hong Kong government were compared with those of last year when the epidemic was in full swing. And there are other implications hidden in the data, which we will analyze later. Let's first look at the results of the Super Golden Week. It didn't bring a boom to Hong Kong's economy. With rising economic expectations driven by the Hong Kong government, the city had high hopes for the long holiday, especially for mainland tourists. But it turned out, as shown in a famous Hong Kong comedy movie, when you think they booked the luxurious Regent Hotel, they booked the Regent Grand Hotel, which was, in fact, a small, cheap inn. This year, many Hong Kongers have already noticed that since the mainland's economy has begun to decline and flexible employment or unemployment has increased, the spending power of the tourists visiting Hong Kong has also been greatly reduced. Among the number of cross-border travelers officially recorded, there is a significant portion who take advantage of the convenient customs clearance situation to frequently transport goods that are subject to restrictions at the border from which they may earn fees for handling the goods or sell the goods on their own to earn the difference in price. Many of them are residents living in either Hong Kong or Shenzhen in the first place, so the actual number of tourists isn't what it seems to be. Moreover, among these tourists, there is a group called Special Forces Poor Travelers. They have become a popular way of traveling for young people. It refers to traveling to a place and trying to eat for free, stay for free, and enjoy complimentary services to keep spending to a minimum. Naturally, one can't count on them to boost the economy in Hong Kong. Media in Hong Kong has reported this group of travelers from the mainland. In order to avoid hotel expenses, they lived in the temporary summer residence provided by the Hong Kong government and even sneaked into the Chinese University of Hong Kong and slept inside the teaching building. Such tourists can't stimulate consumption, but, on the contrary, disrupts the normal social order and adds to the social burden. It's unlikely for Hong Kong to go back to the past because its overall environment has experienced irreversible changes. So, now, what can Hong Kong rely on to sustain its economy? On the surface, it relies on two things to prop it up. First, it relies on the street vendors' economy to drive Hong Kong's development. 
Street vendor economy is an important sign of Hong Kong's turning into part of mainland China. The financial secretary in charge of Hong Kong's economy said openly in the media earlier that he hoped the business sector would make concerned efforts to revitalize Hong Kong's night markets and that it was necessary to rely on Hong Kong night markets to set up street stalls to boost the economy. And this kind of mention was never heard in Hong Kong before. It means that the point of economic growth in Hong Kong has vanished. Hong Kong is now relying on downgrading consumption, the night markets and internal circulation or domestic consumption cycle to hold itself up. Secondly, it relies on a kind of optimistic forecast shaped by storytelling and propaganda by the media to stabilize its economy. At present, the media in Hong Kong is virtually all party media with one voice. Under such circumstances, news is inevitably one-sided, filled with all sorts of optimistic propaganda. The confidence in the Hong Kong market would start to rebound under various lulling tactics. According to the Hong Kong Business Confidence Index released by S&P, the entire forecast for 2023 is at a record high. It's one of the most optimistic moments of forecasting over the last 10 years. Naturally, the higher the expectations for the future, the greater the disappointment. Here are the import and export figures for Hong Kong. The charts are showing both imports and exports are in a downward spiral. Overall, there hasn't been much improvement in trade. The same is true for Hong Kong's financial market. The entire Hong Song index has been at a low level. It has been around 18,000 points recently, compared with 30,000 points two years ago. The entire stock market has shrunk significantly, and a large amount of funds have flowed out of the stock market. The outflow of capital reflects an important phenomenon, that is, amidst the depression of all industries, one industry has prospered against the trend. It's related to capital flight, trafficking, and runaway. However, this industry is very narrow and can't support the entire Hong Kong economy. Therefore, the entire Hong Kong is still in a state of limbo. The data issued by the Hong Kong government also includes the real estate market. What is the implication here? Let's look at the Senta City Leading Index. It represents the basic trend of secondhand properties in Hong Kong. One can see that it's at its worst since 2018. The market suddenly rebounded when the COVID restrictions were lifted in early 2023. Property prices rebounded around that time, and Hong Kong homeowners immediately took advantage of the highs to quickly sell their homes. That is to say, the Hong Kong shareholders and home sellers are waiting for the right time to cash in, and they no longer do selling and buying as they used to do. Selling on the high side will be the rule for the Hong Kong property market and the stock market in the long run. It's fair to say the property market and the stock market in Hong Kong are now left with only one function, namely to allow capital to leave Hong Kong and run away. This can be seen more clearly from the capital movements. The net capital outflow from Hong Kong in the second quarter of 2023 was about US 10 billion. Looking at the historical charts of the past few years, the capital flow after the epidemic outbreak was dominated by net outflows. It's the opposite of the past where huge amounts of capital flowed in. Hong Kong has increasingly become a short-term capital transit point and no longer has the ability to attract capital investment for the medium to long term. Judging from what's said so far, no major change is likely to happen to benefit the Hong Kong economy. What's left to do is to create short-term favorable moments to facilitate the sale of assets on the high side. The Hong Kong economy is becoming a zombie economy that's devoid of any internal growth. Hong Kong used to be a window for Western capital to connect to the Chinese economy. Now that the West and China have gradually decoupled, Hong Kong's function as a window is declining to the point that it will eventually disappear. So what will Hong Kong, the Oriental Pearl, look like in the future? A Hong Kong writer wrote this in his novel, which is seen by many as a prophecy of some sort for Hong Kong. This was what he wrote. A big city, even one with a global economic significance, can suffer the same fate. It is not necessary to destroy the buildings of the city. It is not necessary to kill any of its residents. The city may even appear on the surface to be exactly the same as it was before. 
but it can be destroyed and killed simply by taking away its original advantages. And this can be done by the foolish remarks and actions of just a few people. Just a few people's wild and ignorant decisions can destroy a metropolis. The city can still be on the map, but it is only a shell left. It's no longer a living city. Is what's described in the passage like what is happening in Hong Kong? There is no need to destroy the buildings in Hong Kong. On the surface, Hong Kong looks the same as before. It's still on the map, but the original merits of Hong Kong have disappeared. It's deteriorating and dying, with a shell remaining. It's no longer a city with a life of its own. Simply put, if a city's original strengths or distinctive attributes have disappeared, the city is deprived of its liveliness. We predict that the upstream and downstream industries related to capital flight will continue to exist in Hong Kong for a long time to come. And it mainly includes the related business involved in banking and financial institutions. In terms of finance, Hong Kong has two major functions. One is to attract capital inflow, and the other is to facilitate capital outflow. The so-called capital inflow is that Hong Kong, through its open financial services to the outside world, allows international capital to invest in listed companies and enterprises in China conveniently. And this is the function of attracting capital, in fact. In addition, since the flow of capital in Hong Kong is not as susceptible to regulation and restriction as that in mainland China, flowing capital out of Hong Kong is relatively free of extra obstacles. This is its second function. As the decoupling of China and the West accelerates, the first function of Hong Kong, the function of international financing, is rapidly weakening. It has become difficult for Hong Kong as a financial market to attract foreign exchange from the West. It's only able to attract foreign exchange from China's allies at the present stage, for example from Russia, Iran and other countries. The foreign exchange of these countries don't have purchasing power in the international arena, thus not as useful as hard currencies like American dollars. However, in this aspect of capital outflow, Hong Kong hasn't set too many restrictions yet, so this function is expected to continue for some time to come. China's powerful and elite still have the need to move their corruption and bribery money overseas. It needs Hong Kong to perform this service. A path of dependence, you may say. Hong Kong has lost half of its traditional financial functions, and the remaining half of its functions can only support some very narrow industries. Except for capital flight industries in terms of the entire economy of Hong Kong, be it trade, tourism or finance, or real estate, they are all going to crumble. That is why Hong Kong leaves people with the impression of being alive and moving but having no more vitality. The only reason why this economy seems alive is because the powerful class of the CCP still needs Hong Kong to serve some kind of function like money laundering and capital flight.